The idea of putting solar collectors out in space, where the sun shines 99% of the time, dates back to 1968. Here is the inventor, Dr. Peter Glazer, explaining power satellites with the aid of a globe. The mass of a 5 gigawatt power satellite is around 30,000 tons. The physics of microwaves, used to get the energy to the ground, dictates the large size. The cost to lift parts to space have made them uneconomical to date. We attempt here to fix that with beamed energy bootstrapping, using propulsion power satellites to power flight above low Earth orbit. If we can get the transport cost low enough, this is an energy source large enough to reverse the buildup of CO2 in the atmosphere. Transporting parts into space starts with Skylon, a UK project by Reaction Engines. They have developed a new kind of engine that can fly cargo to space cheaply. This is a cargo stack being constructed in low Earth orbit. It's made of 1,000 15-ton Skylon payloads. Two of these stacks contain enough parts for one power satellite. Here is a 2,000-ton electric thrust tug that moves cargo above low Earth orbit. Its arc jets are powered by 400 megawatts of power from a 25 gigahertz microwave beam. The tanks, more Skylon cargo containers, hold 4,000 tons of hydrogen for the arc jets. The 500-meter circle in the fork is the Rectenna. It receives beamed microwave power and provides DC power for the engines. Examples of the engine already exist. This is a 50 megawatt unit shown firing into air at the Arnold Engineering Development Complex in Tennessee. The cargo and tug spiral out slowly, taking about 220 orbits to get out to 12,000 kilometers. The red in this animation represents the density of space junk. The expected hit rate is under 1 in 100. Only large trackable pieces will cause serious damages. The source of the microwave power beam that powers the tug is a propulsion power satellite. It is one-tenth the size of a regular power satellite and stationed half as far out, 18,000 kilometers, rather than GEO at 36,000 kilometers. We need two of them in orbit on opposite sides of the Earth. The two switch off powering two tugs, the tugs take a 30-day cycle to raise cargo and return, giving a 1,000-ton per day flow of power satellite parts to the construction site at 12,000 kilometers. The first PPS can raise the second, taking twice as long or lifting half as much. The hard question is how we get the first out to its station through the space junk, almost all of which is below 2,000 kilometers. Our answer is to build the first propulsion power satellite in a 2,000-kilometer orbit. So we have to use a lot of chemical fuel and punch through the junk to a 2,000-kilometer orbit, which takes about an hour. We propose to build regular power satellites at 12,000 kilometers. This is the low radiation area between the Van Allen belts. The first propulsion power satellite is an exception. It will be constructed at 2,000 kilometers, just above the space junk belt. The parts for the first propulsion power satellite comes up in 370 containers, that also carry chemical and arc jet fuel. The bottom two layers contain hydrogen and oxygen fuel. First rocket firing puts the stack on a transfer trajectory to a 2,000 kilometer orbit to get above the space junk. Second firing puts the stack of cargo containers in a circular orbit at 2,000 kilometers. We are now above the space junk, so can unpack and construct the PPS. <laughs> The first thing unpacked is a roll former. It takes coils of metal and turns them into channel beams. First we make two construction cubes. Then the cubes push apart with more channel beams to make a frame. The frame section is 50 meters. It expands to 1600 meters on a side. A 
gantry is then installed on each side. The gantry is used to install 60 tapered radiator tubes, the water cooling for the concentrated PV, then the concentrated PV. The transmitting antenna is one kilometer in diameter. The operating frequency is 25 gigahertz, 10 times that of a regular power satellite. This and cutting the distance to half the distance to geo allows the rectennas on the tugs to be reduced to 500 meters in diameter. Initially, arc jets are installed on the transmitter. This allows the propulsion power satellite to self-power out to its 18,000 kilometer orbit. The solar conversion to electricity used here is 40% efficient concentrated photovoltaic mounted on the north and south sides of the frame under the mirrors. The heat from the 60% not converted to electric power is removed from the cells by cold water. The warmed water is cooled by exposure to low pressure. The resulting steam is condensed in the long tapered radiator tubes. Each tube radiates 25 megawatts. The reflectors focus light on the leading and trailing top and bottom surfaces of the frame. This requires active tracking by small individual mirrors. They focus the light on a line of 10 sections of concentrated PV under each mirror. The mirrors, two square kilometers of them, are spaced so they are not shaded by the transmitter disc or each other. The gantry and the arm platform give access to all parts of the radiator tubes. After the PPS is completed, the gantry and arm will be used to patch micrometeorite holes in the radiator tubes. Large as this proposal is, it is only a pilot program. 10 or 12 satellites a year does not solve the carbon and energy problem. To do that will require a construction rate of 400 a year, more than one a day. And this construction rate will run almost a decade to replace current fossil fuel use, or longer for some growth in energy use and more people being raised out of energy poverty. The low cost transport mechanism proposed here can be scaled up to high construction rates 400 power satellites a year takes a prodigious effort to construct 140 skylons a month. Once fossil fuel use is replaced, excess power could be used to capture and store CO2.